Hi everyone and welcome to the next video in the Endgame series. This time we're going to look at the question of which is stronger out of bishops and knights in the Endgame and the reasons why in either case. After rook endings, minor piece endgames are probably the most common, so it's very important to be able to judge which piece is best given the position. Of course this is of great importance to consider when you're making exchanges earlier in the game and as always the pawn structure is a very important factor. As a general rule, the bishop should be preferred if the pawn structure is asymmetrical, as the bishop's ability to multitask will make it superior to the knight because it can attack and defend at the same time. Also, if the pawn structure is symmetrical, but the pawns are fixed in such a way to make the bishop a good bishop, i.e. on squares opposite to that which the bishop travels on, for his own side and with the opponent's pawns fixed on the squares that the bishop does travel on so he can attack them. Conversely, the knight is stronger if the pawn structure is symmetrical, but the pawns are fixed in such a way that the bishop is made bad, i.e. all on squares the same as the bishop travels on, and with the opponent's pawns all on squares opposite to that which the bishop travels on. Also, the knight is better if the position is so closed that the bishop is unable to utilize its superiority and reach, whilst the knight is able to jump around in the position and exploit holes in the opponent's defense. The following example is from a game that the great rivals Boris Spassky and Bobby Fischer played in Santa Monica in 1966. Spassky had white and open with d4, and then came a Grunfeld defense, for knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, and d5. And I'm just going to skip on now to the point I want to talk about in more depth. Play continues with one of the many book lines for the Grunfeld. Now rook d8, which is the last book move of the game. Play continued like this. It's a fairly complex middle game with good accuracy from both sides and it's still completely equal. And rook f6 from Fischer. And at this point Spassky used his endgame knowledge to initiate the correct exchange in order to go into a favorable ending with knight e4 which is threatening to win the exchange because the rook is pinned by the queen and so it forces bishop takes e4. Now can bishop takes e4, and queen c5, getting the queens off the board. With uh, queen takes c5, and now Fisher played a rook takes f1 check, which is a move that was condemned by some commentators at the time. But the point is that if instead b takes c5, now could come a rook c1, forcing c4 to save the c-pawn and now rook c3 threatening rook a3 which is uncomfortable for black either way the ending certainly favors white so rook takes f1 check is what Fisher played now king takes f1 b takes c5 and now a very nice move from Spassky if you want to try and spot it then stop the video now h4 was the move and the point is that it's crucial to fix the g pawn where it is on a square the same color as the bishop if black plays g5 now then white can get a dangerous outside pass pawn which is uh, notoriously awkward for a knight to stop so that's not an option so the pawn stays fixed and attacked by the bishop so knight c4 king e2 knight e5 king e3 king f6 both players centralize their kings. King f4, knight f7, king e3, and now g5 from Fischer, which must have been a difficult choice and maybe is an incorrect one. The pawn is removed from the pressure of the bishop, but now white can create that dangerous past h pawn. Uh, the GMs Gligoric and Cafferty at the time analyzing the game were of the opinion that playing instead knight h6 resulted in better drawing chances. For example, king d3, knight f5, king c4, knight takes h4, king takes c5, king e5, and black can look for play against white's g-pawn and should be able to hold for a draw. So g5 
anyway now h5 creating that pass pawn knight h6 stopping the pawn from advancing but now comes some good grinding technique from Spassky king d3 king e6 bishop a8 king d6 and king c4 and the white king is heading to make threats on black's a and c pawns against which there was little that Fisher could do his knight being tied to this passive post on h6 and now white has a big edge overall in the position at the g4 a4 is advancing this pawn now knight g8 a5 knight h6 passive moves but there's nothing for black in the position g3 king b5 and there's no way for black to defend both of the pawns and white is playing effectively a piece up because this knight is tied to stopping the h pawn so knight g8 bishop b1 knight h6 king a6 king c6 and now another nice move from Spassky with bishop a2 which is using another one of the endgame principles we've already looked at and not rushing if he takes the a pawn straight away with his king then black can try and get some activity with the advance of the c pawn but this bishop a2 move stops the c pawn in its tracks and next black's a pawn will fall after which white's a pawn will advance and queen so it was a fine example of endgame skill from Spassky especially considering who his opponent was okay on to the next example this is another famous example featuring Bobby Fischer it was played against Mark Taimanov in 1971 on Fischer's legendary path to the world championship it falls into the category where the pawn structure is symmetrical and white has the good bishop the bishop is able to attack black's weak g6 pawn and thus force the knight into a passive defensive role at the same time the pawn structure on the queen side is full of holes on the light squares which allows the white king to penetrate via c4 and b5 with decisive effect so king d3 is what bishop played here came knight d7 and bishop e8 tying the knight to the defense of g6 now king d5 from Taimanov taking the opposition which Fischer now sold with the bishop f7 check and after king d6 played king c4 which is threatening to penetrate and uh, b5 so Taimanov played king c6 but now bishop e8 check king b7 king b5 penetrating and taking the opposition and it appears that black is close to Zugzwang now but here he has knight c8 where there's no bishop takes g6 because of knight d6 which is mate so knight c8 bishop c6 check which king c7 the correct move now bishop d5 knight d7 attacking the bishop so bishop f7 again tying the knight down and king b7 and here the first stage of the winning strategy is over white has advanced his king as far as possible for now and forced black into a passive position the next step is to make room for the king on either a6 or c6 which can be achieved by rerouting the bishop so bishop b3 now king a7 like so knight is guarding c6 for now so the king can't penetrate just yet so bishop d1 king b7 and bishop f3 check and this diagonal that the bishop has just moved on to is without doubt the correct diagonal given the position now king c7 playing instead king a7 allows white a very strong continuation if you want to try and spot it then stop the video now bishop g2 is the move and now black is in Zugzwang if uh, king b8 the only king move possible then king takes b6 and white wins and if the knight moves then king c6 with a decisive king penetration for white other than that black can sack a c pawn which will change nothing so it's completely winning after bishop g2 so king c7 is correct and now king a6 immobilizes the black king if black wishes to hold on to his b pawn uh, which he must do if he wants to try and hold out for a draw so all he has now is knight moves so time enough played knight c8 became bishop d5 knight d7 bishop c4 knight c6 bishop f7 knight d7 bishop e8 and now black can't move his king 
without losing the b-pawn and he can't move his knight without losing the g-pawn his only saving move is king d8 which is threatening to take the bishop in the event of king takes b6 okay that's the end of part one